This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship on this beautiful uh, late summer, early fall day. Um, as you uh, probably can't see from, uh, from your television set or your computer, but I can see here we, do, uh, we have resumed in-person worship. And it is great to look out and see faces. Um, if you are here in the, uh, in the sanctuary, a reminder to please um, keep your mask on and keep your nose covered as part of your mask. Uh, we are refraining from uh, significant exhalations. Okay, so I um, would invite you, when we get to hymns or the sung responses for our great prayer of thanksgiving, to either mouth the words or sing quietly, um, but to keep your mask on um, and minimize aerosols and all those words that we've had to become more and more familiar with in these days. A um, couple announcements. Uh, Lee and I are going to be going away for two weeks here uh, starting tomorrow. And we have the, uh, the joy and privilege of having Dr. Jerry Root uh, preach for us next week, and the week after that, uh, Dr. Trig Johnson from uh, Hope College. And so I hope you will um, either show up to support and encourage them or tune in uh, from home. Okay. Also, while Lee and I are gone, Monica will be doing the uh, brown bag lunches uh, here on the patio if the uh, weather permits or spread out in the gathering place, if not. And so I hope you will uh, join her and uh, take the opportunity to catch up with her a little bit. And I think that's all the announcements I have. So let us turn our hearts and our minds to the worship of our God as we listen to this morning's intro. Now please join me for our call to worship. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. O Lord, open our lips. And our mouths will proclaim your praise. Now please rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn, number 533, I Come With Joy.
You may be seated. challenges as we <laughs> continue to get uh, difficulties ironed out. Um, with brothers and sisters, there's a, uh, there's a wonderful little word in the Bible that is sometimes translated sincerity or uh, focus. It is, it's the opposite of duplicity. And there really isn't a direct translation, but it's that sense of, of really being um, true and honest, both with one another and with ourselves. Yeah. And that is what confession is all about. It's being honest with ourselves and honest with our God about who we are, about where we have uh, stumbled, and bringing those things before him, knowing that God has already forgiven us. And so we can avoid that duplicity, that double-mindedness, and be pure and honest with him. So let us confess our sin before God and one another, first silently, and then together using the printed prayer. In praying together, Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Really hear that. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. Know that in Jesus, God embraces you, forgives you, and strengthens you to live a renewed life. Thanks be to God. Please join me for our prayer for illumination. Living God, help hear your holy word with open hearts so that we may truly understand and understanding that we may believe and believing that we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from Exodus, chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. Our Old Testament reading is the account of the Passover meal. The sacramental meal of the Jewish people foreshadows the Christian sacrament of the Lord's Supper. A reading from Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month 
Each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share it, share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animal you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire, with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. The word of God for the people of God. Our epistle reading comes from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. In our epistle reading this morning, Paul continues to remind us about how the gospel impacts our lives as disciples. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commands there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The word of God for the people of God. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew. This morning we are in the 18th chapter and reading verses 15 through 20. So let us attend the word of God for us on this Lord's day. Jesus said, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they, are, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, 
that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Lord our God, once again, I ask that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts and our minds be acceptable in your sight. For you indeed are our God, you are our rock, you are our redeemer. Amen. So my father was a, an aeronautical engineer, worked for Martin Marietta, and um, as an engineer, he also was often a project manager. And I remember my dad early on teaching me an important lesson about management. Criticize in private, praise in public. Okay. Criticize in private, but praise in public. Over the years, it's something that I have uh, seen done well and done poorly. Yeah. Um, have tried myself to do it well when I've had responsibility for the work of others. But that idea of criticizing in private is uh, it's a biblical idea. Right? It's what Jesus is talking about this morning. He says, if someone has an issue with you, right, talk to them in private. If you have an issue with them, talk to them in private. Just the two of you. And try and sort it out. And then he says, if that doesn't work, well, you go on and you, you bring in others. It is really kind of, you know, management 101. But Jesus here is trying to help us learn how to get along. How do we get along in the church where we have so many different people with different attitudes, different beliefs, different politics? How do we work together rather than just be present in the same place? You know, every time I do a new member class or do a, a new officer training class, one of the things we do is we look at the Book of Confessions. Yeah. And the Book of Confessions is this, uh, it's the first part in our um, Presbyterian Constitution. It's a collection of, of writings from the church that help explain, help us to understand who we are as Reformed Christians and, and what we are called to do. And one of the documents in that book of confessions is the Scots Confession. Um, it's a, a, uh, pres a Presbyterian, Scottish Presbyterian document uh, that we have adopted uh, from very early on. And, and within that, there is a, a very well-known section about the marks of the true church, or the true kirk is the way that the Scots Confession puts it. And those three marks of the, of the church, okay, first one is where the word of God is rightly preached. Okay. It's saying in a, in a true Christian church, you're going to hear preaching that is, uh, is right. That is, it's going to be preaching that is from the scriptures. It's not just going to be a, a pep talk. It's not going to be just the opinions of, of some human being standing in front of you. Okay? That true preaching is supposed to be uh, opening up the word of God so that we understand it and apply it better. And then the second mark is that in a true church, the, the sacraments are rightly administered. And we're not going to go into a lot of sacramental theology here, but um, you know, we, we gather around the table to celebrate 
our, our communion with God and with one another through Christ. We enter into the fellowship of the church through the sacrament of baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, and having those things present in a church is a sign that this is a real church. This is, this is a truly Christian church. And most new members and new officers, they're, they're fine with those two. But then we get to the third mark of the church. And the third mark is it's where Christian discipline is rightly administered. And usually people kind of, you know, give me a funny look. You know, the idea of church discipline is not something most of us are very comfortable with. Either we ourselves or someone we know has been wounded by the church. As Americans, we don't like people telling us what to do. Right? Church discipline is not something we're really keen on. And yet that is exactly what Jesus is commanding us to do here. Right? He is saying that we are required to keep each other accountable. He doesn't say, you know, if you feel like saying something, do it in private. He says, no. If you've got an issue with someone, if someone's got an issue with you, you've got to say something. First in private and then in larger circles if needed. Jesus is telling us that this, this church discipline is part and parcel of being a disciple. Yeah. We are called to keep one another accountable. And that is, that is challenging. How do you help others to see where they are falling short in their life of faith, where they are out in the world not looking like Jesus in a way that doesn't make you sound like a jerk? Yeah. It's challenging. It needs to be done in love. But it needs to be done. If there is somebody in the church who uh, we know is sleeping around, someone in the church we know is dipping into the till, someone we know is a habitual liar, we need to say something. And again, that's, that's a really challenging thing to do, to, to offer it as constructive criticism and not as carping, eh? certainly not as an opportunity to, to stick it to someone we don't really care for. Eh? It's an act of love. I was reminded this week as I was preparing for this morning, uh, you know, if you, if you go to the car mechanic, take your car down to Harbor Car Care, and you, you go and pick it up, and they were, you know, just doing an oil change and looking it over, and you say, how's, you know, how's everything? And they said, oh, you, you are such a great owner. Your car is just, just wonderful. You do such a good job. Um, no worries. Change the oil. You can go your way. And as we're driving home, first we see smoke coming out of the of the wheel, and then, and then the brakes give out. Yeah. You're not going to be happy with that mechanic. They may have told you nice things about yourself, eh, but they put you in danger by not being honest about the challenges that your car faced. Eh. Same with a doctor. Eh. You don't want to go to the doctor and have them give you a clean bill of health and then the next day find yourself in the emergency room with a heart attack. We need honesty from one another in order to grow as we are required to grow as Christians. Because the reality is we don't see it in ourselves. So often our, our sin, our shortcoming, you know, it's like spinach in your teeth. Everyone else notices, but no one's willing to say something. Right? Yeah. We need to hear it. 
And it is an act of love to care about somebody enough to say something. But then, of course, there's the flip side. Recognizing that we don't see our own faults and we need to hear others as they help us to to recognize them. We need to be open to receiving that correction, that, that discipline. And I don't know about you, but it's not my favorite thing. Yeah. I don't like being corrected. I don't like being told that I'm, I'm doing things the wrong way. But how will I ever do better if nobody tells me? Scripture's a little more blunt about it. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 12, verse, uh, verse 1, says this, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, okay? but whoever hates correction is stupid. Yeah. I don't want to be stupid. Yeah. And I want others to care enough about me to not let me be stupid. Right? To be willing to say here it is. Yeah. You know, so often church, as we've talked about before, church is this place where we pretend we've got it all together. And you know what? Not one of us does. Is that me? I think so. Are we better? Are we gone? Okay, there we are. Um, see, none of us have it together. Right? <laughs> um, you know, and yet, church is supposed to be a family. It's supposed to be where we can be open and honest with one another and with ourselves. Okay? And if we're going to be effective as disciples, if we're going to be effective as ambassadors of Christ, we need one another to keep each other accountable. That is, that is why Jesus says at the end, look, okay, when you guys are, are in this together, okay, when you're really in it together and not just pretending that this is you know, a great social interaction that looks good, when we're in this together openly and honestly, then, then we have the ability to do God's will. Okay? Then Christ is among us. And then the church has an impact in the world. Okay? So long as we refuse to listen to others and acknowledge where we fall short, so long as we fail to love one another and help them see where they fall short, we go out in the world and we look like hypocrites. And we're not effective in being the church. And the great thing about being the church is that as we do church well, as we learn within a loving, trusting relationship to be open and honest, then we learn to do that in other places too. Okay. But Jesus tells us to start here. He says when your brother or sister's got an issue, when you've got an issue with your brother or sister, not some stranger on the street, okay. not somebody who walks into the store that you don't like what they're doing or how they're doing it. Okay. It's here with each other, with family. And that radical honesty with one another yeah. is how we really learn to get along as disciples of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now this morning as we prepare to receive our offering for those who are uh, 
present here in the, uh, in the building, uh, there is an offering plate by the sanctuary door um, that you are more than welcome to make use of, either on your way in or your way out. Um, for those of you at home, if you'd like to make a, uh, a monetary offering to the church, you can use the donate button on our webpage, um, or you can write a check and send it in to our uh, P.O. Box 866. Um, but this morning, one of the things I would encourage us to offer before God yeah, is that honesty. Honesty with ourselves and that love of others that is deep enough to be honest with them. So let us bring our offerings before God this morning. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together gathered together to listen to your word and to witness to its truths. We give joyously today and dedicate this offering to your work. We are inspired to share your glorious love with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Increase our talents and offerings so that your name is exalted with unending praise. Blessed is your name. Amen. Be seated. This morning, as we prepare to uh, come to the Lord's table, 
A couple things to keep in mind. First of all, the, the responses during the great prayer of thanksgiving will be sung. You are invited to join in. The music will be up there. Okay. Um, and secondly, uh, in your prayers this week, there are a number of people I would ask you to uh, keep in mind. A okay. um, number of our members who have been hospitalized of late, and those include Bob Wolf uh, and Randy Hagerman, Ken Miller, who is home and recovering well, I understand, um, Kathy Budzik, who's um, been in and out of the hospital, and we have uh, prayed before for uh, Ken Parada, who is our neighbor down the street in, uh, um, over in, in our area in Tamarack. And Ken also had uh, went into the hospital and then was flown down to uh, Flint. So I ask you to be in prayer for Ken and for his, uh, his wife as well, um, Monica. So. And brothers and sisters, as we come to the table, let us do so remembering whose table this is. That this is Christ's table. This is uh, the place where Jesus is the host. And that he invites you to come to the table. To come openly and honestly in your successes, in your failures, in your good and your bad to come to the table where you are fed and encouraged, strengthened, and lifted up. So please join me in prayer this morning. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us, even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his life, death, and resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious God, we give you thanks that on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin." Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come. Lord our God, send out your Holy Spirit so that this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we and all your saints be united with Christ and remain faithful in hope and love. Gather your whole church, O Lord, into the glory of your kingdom. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For those who are here in the sanctuary, you uh, have received the elements in a convenient little packet. Um, You'll find that if you remove the the top clear layer, that underneath is uh, the wafer for the bread. So I invite you to take that, and if you're home, take bread there. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And you will find the juice under the next layer. Sisters and brothers, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Drink of it, all of you. Now, sisters and brothers, having been fed and nourished by our Lord, let us stand up and sing our closing hymn, just as the disciples did at that first supper where they departed with a hymn.
As we faithfully live our lives in this coming week, what does God call us to do? Christ-centered, missional church that proclaims the word of God and demonstrates the relevance of his word to all people. And sisters and brothers, as we leave this place, let us be honest. Let us be honest with ourselves and honest with one another, speaking the truth in love and going and receiving God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest on and abide in you this day and every day. Hallelujah and amen. Life.